Okay, why don't we begin? Uh, welcome to the midterm briefings. Uh, and uh, we today, uh, what we'll be focusing on uh, is uh, the nature of the problem in each of our uh, pieces of legislation and uh, the science of the problem and also focusing on uh, the legislation itself. And these are really a set of progress reports. In our sections, we've been briefing each other and uh, now we get to brief the entire class. Uh, Stephanie, why don't you explain the rules for today and how we're going to proceed? Sure. So the presenters will um, be able to share their video um, and obviously talk. And then after they're done, we'll get three questions per presentation. And you can ask those questions either through the Q&A box at the bottom, or you can raise your hand and I will unmute you. Okay. So we're going to start with uh, the briefing on Water Power Research and Development Act that uh, Rachel will be delivering. Uh, and that's the group that is advised by Professor Howard Apson. So Rachel, take it away. She's still muted. Ed. <laughs> Hello everyone, I was muted. Uh, happy Wednesday. My name is Rachel Goodgall. I am here for Potential Power Team, and I will be discussing today the Water Power Research and Development Act. Before I begin, I'd like to thank my team members on this task, Catherine Lynn and Jessica Kenny, as well as our, advise, our manager of the team, Liz Wilson, our deputy manager, Colleen Neely, and our esteemed advisor, Professor Apson. Today, we'll start by talking about the bill. What is it trying to solve? We'll get into the science of the problem, discuss barriers to alternative energies, and finally touch on the government action needed. The Water Power Research and Development provides for a program of research, development, demonstration, and commercial application in two related sectors, hydropower and marine energy technology. We'll start with hydropower because it's something that most of us know about. It's one of the oldest forms of electricity production and currently provides about 7% of US electricity. At hydropower plants, water turns a turbine to spin a generator and produce electricity. It's, as I mentioned, it's a pretty old and well-established form of energy. The Grand Coulee Dam shown here was built all the way back in the 1930s and our hydro capacity hasn't increased very much since the 1970s. So our bill allocates funding and creates programs to improve hydropower. Notably, it seeks to increase power generation by improving efficiency and by developing better components and plant systems. It aims to reduce the environmental impacts of new and existing hydro plants and to increase reliability, including in the face of extreme weather events. The bill also focuses on, and in fact directs the majority of its appropriations to programs for marine energy. Marine energy is comprised of several different technologies, most of which are new and are much less developed than conventional hydropower. Marine energy includes energy that comes from waves, tides, and currents in oceans, from free flowing water in rivers and many other bodies of water, from salinity and pressure gradients, and from water temperature differentials, including ocean thermal energy. The photo here on your right shows a turbine system that can capture energy from free flowing water and can be used in both rivers and tidal settings. Goals of the bill with regards to marine energy are assisting with technological development and testing to demonstrate readiness of new energy options, addressing resource variability, including by investigating storage options and advancing integration into the grid, and identifying and reducing environmental impacts of these technologies. So what's the problem? Why do we need this bill? Well, as you can see, renewable energy, which includes hydropower, makes up only about 17% of our electricity mix. On the other hand, Fossil fuels, specifically coal and natural gas, are the sources for well over 60% of the electricity generated in the United States. Both of these fuels contribute to glo global climate change when combusted. They also cause a variety of environmental damages that happen from extraction to electricity generation. 
First, let's talk about coal. Coal is very abundant in the United States, and it's been a major energy source since way back in the 1880s. Unfortunately, coal extraction and combustion both create a host of problems. Mining drastically alters local landscapes and wastewater discharges acidic residue and heavy metals into nearby waterways. This picture shows a stream near a mine near Pittsburgh, which is polluted with waste. Both mining and combustion also release a variety of air pollutants, including particulate matter, which is linked to lung disease in humans. The sulfur dioxides and nitrogen oxides produced when coal is combusted also contribute to respiratory illnesses, and when they mix with water vapor, they cause acid rain, which damages both ecosystems and human infrastructure. And of course, coal combustion produces a huge amount of carbon dioxide, which contributes to the climate crisis. Natural gas is the largest single source of electricity in the United States, and its increasing share over the last 20 years can be attributed to hydraulic fracturing or fracking. Fracking involves drilling deep into the shale layer, turning horizontally, and pumping in large quantities of liquid at high pressure to fracture the shale and release natural gas. Each fracking operation uses an average of 4 million gallons of water, and the wastewater has many pollutants in it, including methane, radionuclides, and trace amounts of arsenic, bromine, and heavy metals. One of the nation's largest fracking resources is the Marcellus Shale, which spans New York, Pennsylvania, and West Virginia. Here we show a map of all the fracking wells in Pennsylvania. We've circled Susquehanna County, which has a high concentration of fracking wells, including in the town of Dimmick, Pennsylvania. Cabot Oil and Gas began fracking in Dimmick in 2008, and soon afterwards, residents started reporting problems with their drinking water. Here, a resident holds up tap water that he says was contaminated by fracking. 15 families sued Cabot and a settlement was reached in 2017, but Environmental violations from wells continued to be cited even after that. And just last week, Pennsylvania's Attorney General charged Cabot for environmental crimes related to fracking. The full extent of health risks caused by fracking leaks and wastewater is not yet certain, but Dimmick certainly offers a cautionary tale. Natural gas is often billed as a cleaner fossil fuel because it releases less carbon dioxide and health harming air pollution than coal when it's combusted. However, its global warming potential may well be undercounted because there is significant methane leakage that happens from extraction to combustion. So coal and natural gas sound pretty bad, right? Why are we still using them? We already have many forms of renewable energy technology and we primarily use so far wind, solar and hydro. However, there are barriers to increasing renewable energy generation. Many renewable technologies such as wind and solar must contend with variations in nature's abundant energy. Some forms of water power like conventional hydro have similar challenges of variability, but others like tidal power are much more predictable. In addition, increasing the mixture of variable sources would together provide a steadier supply of electricity. Another challenge is that renewable sources may be located in rural areas that lack effective transmission. There are also permitting barriers that delay construction. And of course, there are stakeholders on all sides of the issue, some of whom are committed to maintaining fossil fuel de dependence and slowing adoption of renewables. Government action is needed to overcome these obstacles. Our bill makes a large investment in marine energies and hydropower in order to spur innovation and overcome technical challenges. It also seeks to reduce barriers to market entry by both improving cost competitiveness and commercial readiness of water power and by improving the licensing process. Currently, it's not uncommon for licensing to take up to a decade and there are 300 hydro plants that are due for relicensing in the next 10 years. 
such delays would be a huge hindrance to increased capacity. As mentioned earlier, the bill also aims to reduce, to address and reduce the environmental impacts of hydro and marine energy systems. In conclusion, U.S. electricity generation is largely powered by fossil fuels. Water power is an important source to fill out the renewable energy mix, and government action is needed to overcome barriers. Next week, we will hear more about how our bill proposes water power as a solution to the problem of fossil fuel electricity. Sophie Tolomidenko will detail capacity, availability, and resilience of hydropower and marine energy technologies and discuss the implementation strategies in the bill. Thank you very much for your attention, and I would be happy to take questions. Uh, thank you, Rachel. And uh, Stephanie, if you want to entertain some questions. Sure, that'd be great. You guys can raise your hand. Looks like we have one. Um, Alyssa Ramirez, you can talk. Sure, um, great presentation. Um, you guys had mentioned um, improving the efficiency of hydropower um, and dams. Um, does the bill approach existing hydropower or just new technologies? Thanks, Eliza, that's a great question. So the bill is very specific to include both new and existing and existing water power tech. Um, as mentioned, the marine power is more new, but in the hydropower section, they talk a lot about both improving existing infrastructure and creating better new infrastructure. Um, specifically for older hydro plants, they, the bill focuses on improving technology for non-powered aging dams and using analytics and computing power to help extend the operational life and improve the environmental impacts of some of those older dams. Great, we have another question from Jenny. Hi, um, I was wondering, and I, I apologize if you went into this, I missed the first couple of minutes, but um, can you elaborate on the e ecological impacts of hydropower, um, you know, uh, affecting the local ecosystem and waterways and if, if there's a, a focus in this bill on like big hydro versus kind of more smaller scale, because there are a lot of examples of that, of big hydro, like causing a lot of ecological damage. Yeah, absolutely. I did not really go into the environmental impacts of big hydro, and we're going to talk about that later on. But as you mentioned, there are a lot of negative environmental impacts on fish migration, on sediment patterns, on patterns on just the ecosystems around especially large hydro plants. And what the bill does do is point out certain areas that it wants to look into for improving those environmental impacts. Um, it lists specifically uh, fisheries, aquatic life, navigation of waterways, and both upstream, upstream and downstream environmental conditions. Oh, and sorry, you also asked about small hydro. And the bill does, that is one of the, the focuses for new technologies is looking to develop more and better tech for free flowing hydropower systems. Awesome, we have one more question from Russ. Yeah, this, I think this probably follows up on the previous question asked. And uh, I don't know if you've come across these options yet because I was really excited to hear about the title, uh, Energy New Technologies. Uh, and I think this probably follows along with the idea of moving away from big hydro, especially uh, in communities or areas further inland or that are landlocked. But I was just curious to know if, if you have started coming across any, any kinds of uh, newer tech that could be put into rivers uh, for, you know, for communities that are far, far away from the ocean. That's a great question. And again, I think you'll hear more about that from Sophia in the following week. But what we do, what we, what I can speak to from the bill is that in marine energy, they define, they def one of the things about, one of the definitions of marine energy is any energy that comes from free flowing water, 
whether that be rivers, tides, even lakes, you can do some of the, these marine energy technologies in lakes if they have some kind of tidal pattern. Uh, so I think that's really exciting because it's, it's uh, another way to generate electricity that often is more predictable when we have these tides. River's a little bit different because we do have the same issue with precipitation patterns, but especially tides are a lot more predictable. And you, know, you, you asked about inland, I'm recalling, so that ocean tides are not so relevant to your question. But I think the discussion of any kind of free flowing water, rivers, lakes, all of those things are going to be explored in the bill and we'll have more for you in a few weeks. Sounds great. So thank you for a terrific presentation, great questions. Uh, we're going to take a brief break, maybe about three minutes. It's now uh, 10.15, and we will reconvene at 10.18, and Andrew uh, will give the second briefing. So everybody take, stretch your legs for three minutes. Great. Thank you. Okay, everyone, are we ready for our second briefing? Well, ready or not, uh, you're gonna hear uh, from Andrew on the United States Department of Defense uh, Climate Resilience and Readiness Act, uh, and that's the group that I'm advising. So Andrew, it's all yours. Thank you. So. My name is Andrew Solfes, and today I'll be talking about H.R. 2759 as presented to the House of Representatives, the Department of Defense Climate Resiliency and Readiness Act. I'd like to begin by discussing and defining climate change further and the environmental threats posed to the Department of Defense, as well as the role of the Department of Defense in combating climate change. Following, I'd like to discuss the objectives of 2759 and the path forward with challenges and key strengths of this bill. Climate change is defined by the Department of Defense as variations in average weather condition, conditions that persist over time, encompassing changes in temperature, precipitation, and risk and intensity of severe weather events. Climate change is caused largely by the greenhouse effect, which is necessary for life on Earth, but can cause issues through climate change and warming global temperatures. The greenhouse gas effect is in which energy and solar radiation from the sun is trapped by the Earth's atmosphere and gases such as carbon dioxide in order to maintain the warmth of the planet. As you can see by this graphic, climate change or carbon dioxide increases is, are cyclical in nature, 
However, the most recent increase is tied closely to human interactions and activity since the Industrial Revolution. And unfortunately, unlike the other cycles you can see on this graph, the most recent trend shows no sign of dropping after reaching its peak. So why does climate change threaten the Department of Defense? Climate change threatens many installments of the Department of Defense and installations throughout the world through sea level rise. This is as the world warms up through climate change, polar ice caps are melting, causing coastlines to recede and putting over 1,700 military installations at risk for the United States alone. In addition, climate change is tied to many different extreme weather pattern weather patterns, including hurricanes, tornadoes, flooding, droughts, and wildfires, all of which threaten additional inland installations of the Department of Defense and are very costly to deal with. In an assessment by the Department of Defense, over two thirds of critical installations within the United States are at risk, risk due to climate change. And finally, it can threaten national security directly as it aggravates tensions and existing social problems throughout the world. We saw this recently in the case of the Syri civil war in Syria, as drought, um, the worst drought seen in 500 years in the region has exacerbated and helped precipitate the civil war, worsening all of its impacts. So what is the role of the Department of Defense in actually combating climate change? So the Department of Defense, being such a major part of the federal government, is responsible for 77% of its energy consumption. This comes primarily through fossil fuels for both transportation and from production of energy on the civilian U.S. electrical grid. All of these fossil fuels combine to make the DOD responsible for over 59 million metric tons of carbon dioxide produced each year. While this is actually a decrease in the last decade, it still puts the United States at producing more energy from its department or using more energy from its Department of Defense than most countries in the world. And unfortunately, this is a cyclical problem in nature, as roughly a quarter of this operational fuel use goes towards defending the very assets that protect our access to fossil fuels in the Middle East. The Department of Defense is aware of the issue and has made some strides in order to combat this. Primarily through, this has been primarily through the transition of fleet management and fuel usage. They save over $250 million a year by converting a single carrier to hybrid electric. However, they're still falling short in reaching most of their energy consumption and renewable goals, as there were only 6% renewable energy consumption as of 2019, compared to the 25% goal set for 2025. In addition, only 2% of facilities have even been rated to meet net sustainability benchmarks, which means we're wasting a significant amount of energy. H.R. 2759 aims to address this by achieving net zero energy by op non-operational sources by 2029. Non-operational sources mean those that do not include the training, housing, or transport of troops. In addition, this bill proposes implementing climate conscious budgeting and contracting requirements and incorporating climate resilience into existing strategies of the DOD with coordination with the Departments of Energy and the Environmental Protection Agency. This will also put funding towards research and development of microgrid systems, which both allow for improved energy efficiency by reducing loss during transmission, as well as allowing the Department of Defense to be more independent and select where its fuel sources come from, promoting renewable energy usage. Net zero energy is a key part of this bill as, and is defined simply as only putting as much CO2 and other emissions into the atmosphere as you take out. This is done and has been done already by the Department of Defense to some extent through improving energy efficiency and fuel efficiency. Microgrids and renewable energy sources are an essential part in order to fuel the energy that the United States must still use in the Department of Defense. However, acknowledging the fact that it's not possible to make this transition immediately, carbon offsets are a way to fund sources and technologies that take carbon dioxide out of the air um, and offset the balance used. Moving forward, there are both severe challenges politically and key strengths of this bill. Primarily, as we can see with the current administration and within Congress, 
there's a great deal of political opposition. The graphic shown in the street illustrates by percentage the states that have representatives which receive funding from sources that either outright deny, deny climate change or discourage its mitigation. In addition, the Department of Defense acknowledges that there is a lack of environmental stewardship and coordination in climate change mitigation. They're dealing with the symptoms currently, but not actually the problem. However, the Department of Defense is still a key strength of this bill, as national security and the fiscal savings through energy efficiency are both bipartisan goals, and the Department of Defense, with its extreme spending power, can make a huge difference on combating climate change. In addition, over 80% of the United States population is in support of taking more aggressive action on climate change, including 60% of Republican voters, which have primarily been a demographic in the past that is opposed. I look forward to talking more uh, and our team talking more about proposed solutions to climate change and through this bill in the next week. And I wanna thank my team and Professor Cohen for this uh, help in putting together this presentation. Happy to listen to any questions. Thank you, Andrew. Uh, Stephanie, do we have any questions? We do, we have another question from Russ. Okay. So I, I did do recognize uh, the non-operational goal of 2029 for getting to net zero for emissions. Uh, was there anything in the bill uh, or any kinds of goals for operational use for the actual movement of troops where I think we'd see a lot of use of fossil fuels? Yeah, that's a great question and a great point. Operational use accounts for about 70% of what the Department of Defense uses. However, this bill does not address that as it is one, a much more politically uh, contentious part of the Department of Defense. Um, and two, there's already a significant amount of strides that we need to make within the non-operational sources first. Uh, the bill essentially aims to tackle the easier problem first because it can still make a significant impact. And then these technologies can be tr can transition over to support the operational forces as well. Great, we have another question from Charlie. Yeah, I just had a quick question about the biofuel strategy for the DOD going forward. So I know that U.S. farms have converted a significant portion of agriculture to produce corn for biofuel, and I think some of that might be for uh, the DOD. But I was wondering, do they assess the costs, both the embedded costs associated with those and then the externalities, such as the hikes in wheat prices uh, in international markets that can sometimes foment violence and other uprisings? Is that a part of the calculus going on here? And if so, how do they balance that? So biofuels are not actually a primary focus of this bill, but I can certainly get back to you with more information on that. Um, the bill is more focused around energy efficiency and net zero through other renewable sources and microgrids um, in terms of wind and solar, as well as hydro, as Rachel had spoken about in her presentation. But I can certainly get back to you with more information on how they're integrating biofuels. All right, we have time for one more question if you guys want to raise your hand or type it in. All right, I think that's it. Okay. Well, thank you very much, Andrew. Very nice job. Everybody can applaud. Uh, and it's now uh, 1028. So we'll take three minutes and reconvene at 1031. Okay.
Okay, it's now 1031, so we're ready for our third briefing, uh, which is uh, the briefing by the group advised by Professor Cook on the Wildlife Conservation and Anti-Trafficking Act of 2019. And our presenter this morning is Ariella Levy. Ariella, are you ready? Hi, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Um, I am having trouble finding my video. Ah, there we go. There you Thank go. You. Okay. Yeah. Um, so good morning and good evening to everybody and thank you for joining us. My name is Ariella Levy and today I will be presenting the Wildlife Conservation and Anti-Trafficking Act of 2019. Before I begin, I would like to thank my teammates and our wonderful advisor, Dr. Robert Cook, for their support during this process. So to begin this presentation, I would like to give a summary of our legislation. The main objective of the bill is to support wildlife conservation and anti-trafficking at no additional cost to taxpayers. The bill is divided into four titles. Title I is designed to incentivize participants of wildlife trafficking to come forward through a whistleblower reward system. This will help gather information on trafficking and combat activities at the source. Title II is designed to promote wildlife conservation internationally. The Secretary of the Interior will carry out international wildlife program with the US Fish and Wildlife Administration to support species conservation globally. Money received from fines will help fund conservation initiatives. Sorry. Title three is designed to prevent trafficking and poaching at the source. A US Fish and Wildlife Officer will be stationed in countries with high trafficking activity to work with local authorities to enforce conservation and anti-trafficking. Finally, Title IV makes illegal, unreported, and unregulated fishing part of a more serious offense under the money laundering statute. Violations of the Magnuson Stevens Fishery Conservation and Management Act will be subject to large fines and criminal punishment. Money from fines will go towards supporting sustainable fishing and preventing illegally harvested fish from entering US markets. So what is wildlife trafficking? Wildlife trafficking is the illegal gathering, transportation and distribution of plants and animals and their derivatives such as horns, skins and bones. It includes local and regional markets where the poaching occurs as well as international markets for distribution. It has developed due to the following reasons, though these are not comprehensive. Trophy hunting, perceived medicinal value, jewelry, status symbols, and exotic pets. Through this flowchart, we can visualize the impact of wildlife trafficking. Local sustainable demand for wildlife has over the years grown with human population growth and mobility. This has led to the unsustainable taking and distribution of wildlife with two major consequences, biodiversity loss and the global movement of plants and animals, resulting in the spread of zoonotic diseases. I will discuss these further in this presentation. So what is the scope of the impact? Well, wildlife trafficking causes huge loss to society and the environment. In 2014, Defenders for Wildlife estimated that the world's traffickers were selling around 350 million animals and plants a year. The World Bank estimates that this costs 20 to $60 billion a year in ecosystem service losses. The UN estimated that wildlife trafficking accounts for around 23 billion of global GDP. This is mostly comprised of gains to illegal traffickers. In terms of impact and scope, the problem rivals the illicit drug trade. First, we will cover biodiversity loss. Biodiversity loss is the extinction of a species worldwide or loss of a species in a certain habitat. If far reaching, this can result in ecosystem collapse and loss of ecosystem services. Ecosystem services are the direct and indirect contributions of ecosystems to humans. Loss in biodiversity jeopardizes ecosystem health. 
in turn impacting human well-being. To illustrate the multifaceted impact of wildlife trafficking, we will follow the story of the scalloped hammerhead shark. These sharks are predators at the top of the marine food webs. They are found primarily in warm coastline waters in the tropics. They are widely overfished for their fins, which are served as delicacies with perceived medicinal value in China and neighboring regions. A bowl of shark fin soup can sell for up to $100. Due to increasingly high demand, an estimated 73 million total sharks are killed each year only for their fins. This has resulted in devastating ecosystem impacts. Overfishing of hammerhead sharks resulted in increased population of cow nose rays, a predator in the middle of the food chain. The increase in cow nose rays led to the decimation of bivalve mollusk populations. This, in turn, resulted in the collapse of an 100 year old scallop fishery in North Carolina. The story of the hammerhead shark is just one example of how unsustainable poaching and ecosystem collapse can affect human livelihoods. This map shows one possible transit path of the hammerhead sharks. Trafficking begins with harvesters, including trappers, poachers, and guides. For hammerhead sharks, these often include poor coastal communities. Intermediaries, including smugglers, customs officials, and vendors, work complicated networks to distribute the animals and plants to markets. Finally, we have the consumers. From people searching for animal parts for medicine to others looking for new additions to their zoos, consumers are varied and drive the demand for the product. As you move your way up the supply chain, profit margins increase greatly. While local hunters are exploited and earn very little, profits for those who govern the trade rival profits from drug trafficking. Due to the high profits of illegal wildlife trafficking, there is significant involvement by organized crime groups. As seen by this map, for hammerhead sharks, one of the trafficking paths begins in Costa Rica, where it's governed by the Taiwanese mafia. They are then transported to Honolulu for further distribution in Hong Kong. So what are the impacts of wildlife trafficking on human livelihoods? As aforementioned, the overfishing of hammerhead sharks resulted in the collapse of a fishery, affecting the employment of many. Furthermore, declines in biodiversity can impact ecotourism. As with hammerhead sharks, many coastal populations rely on the sharks to entice vacationers. Globally, ecotourism is valued at around $77 billion and generates employment for a million. Declines in biodiversity and perceived threats from organized crime in regions has devastating impacts on human livelihoods. Finally, through the global movement of plants and animals, wildlife trafficking poses major threats to humans. It promotes illegal activities, distributes invasive species, and introduces novel plant and animal diseases. Given current global concerns, we will be focusing on the spread of zoonotic diseases. So zoonotic diseases are illnesses caused by germs, microbial organisms, or pathogens that are passed from animals to humans. It is estimated that between 60 and 75% of emerging infectious diseases in humans come from other animals. Through increased animal-human interactions, often with limited safety precautions, wildlife trafficking augments the risk that a disease could spread. Diseases spread either through direct transmission, when people come in contact with bodily fluids of infected animals, or indirect transmission, via objects that can harbor disease agents, such as food, water, or vectors, including mosquitoes. Regarding wildlife trafficking, we are most concerned with direct transmission. We will visit this through the case study of pangolins. Pangolins are the world's most commonly trafficked animal. Their scales and blood are presumed to have medicinal benefits in Asian and African cultures, and their meat can be considered a delicacy. Pangolins play an important role in their ecosystem as they regulate insect and pest populations, helping to maintain soil and crop quality. In this image, we see a man scaling a pangolin, coming in direct contact with it without any protective gear. Pangolins are known to host many viruses, and some studies have suggested a potential connection between SARS-CoV-19 and pangolins. Through the international distribution of the species, wildlife trafficking has the potential to play a significant role in widespread disease dissemination. 
This is most concerning when species are transported to regions where they are not endemic and locals do not have antibodies for these possible diseases. This is indeed the case for most wildlife trafficking stories. In our following presentation, we look forward to addressing solutions to the problem wildlife trafficking poses. The examples in this presentation only provide a small snippet of the whole story. If left unchecked, wildlife trafficking can have devastating impacts on both natural and anthropogenic systems. Thank you for your attention, and we are now open to questions. Thank you, Ariel. Very nice. Good job. And uh, Stephanie, do we have any questions? Uh, we don't have any questions yet. Um, oh, here we go. We have a question from Karen. Okay. Hi, Ariel. Um, I have two quick questions. One is sort of about the definition of ecological services. I still feel a little bit confused about that. And the second is, um, can these zoonotic diseases be spread by just a fin or do you need to have like a live animal? Yeah, definitely. So your first question uh, regarding ecosystem services, these are usually separated into three categories, which include supportive services. So maybe the role the animal plays in the ecosystem and maintaining its health and then provisional services. So these are services that humans can extract from nature and then cultural services, which include ecotourism or just the, the value of the animal or plant. And then for your second question, uh, they can spread primarily through contact with the bodily fluids. So this is still not fully well understood, but I think they could definitely spread through shark fins as long as you come into contact with some form of the fluid. Um, there's a risk for that. Great, we have another question from Emily. Hi, um, I was wondering how, and I understand if this gets too far into the solution component of the semester, but uh, how your bill handles the sort of entrenched cultural significance of some of these traffic animals. You mentioned the pangolin. Um, does the bill have a strategy for handling the cultural component to this issue? So the bill doesn't directly address that and is more so focused on um, the US side of things, but I believe that there has been significant progress around the world through different international governments to sort of dissuade people from either perceived medicinal values or I know a lot of countries have made progress on ivory to say that it should not be trafficked. And I think that would be targeted through their respective countries. Great, last call for questions. All right, I think that's it. Okay, well, thank you, Ariella. Uh, very good presentation, excellent. Um, and uh, it's now about 10.44. So we're gonna give you a four minute break. This time we'll go to 10.48 and we'll start uh, the briefing with Professor Palmer's group. So everybody take a little break now.
Okay, it's 1048, uh, and in a moment we'll continue. I want to mention to everybody on, on this uh, event that uh, when we finally do this in New York, uh, in between each briefing, uh, we have refreshments, bagels, and uh, other New York delicacies uh, that uh, we are not available to us uh, virtually. But uh, the program owes you at least several bagels and locks and uh, other kinds of things uh, that we'll have when we get to New York. Uh, the, uh, the other thing that happens in between each briefing is people uh, congratulate the briefers and gather around them and often there's lots of photo taking and things of that sort. So we miss all of that and uh, I hope that we get it soon. Uh, but uh, in any case, we are doing a, you guys are doing a wonderful job. These briefings are fabulous. And uh, let's continue now uh, with uh, the fourth of our briefings uh, on the Agricultural Resilience Act, which is uh, being advised by Professor Matt Palmer and Emily Becker is going to give that briefing. So we're ready to go. Emily. Good morning, everybody. My name is Emily Becker. I will be your briefer for the Agriculture Resilience Act Lincoln briefing. I want to thank my team members, whose names you can see on this slide, with a particular word of thanks for Gwen Machione and Louisa Malahides, and to our faculty advisor, Matt Palmer. Let's start with the problem at hand. From our fields to our livestock production to the supply chains that stock our grocery stores and restaurants, wasteful and environmentally harmful practices are incredibly common in U.S. agriculture. Our bill seeks to address these practices and curtail the impact of ag on U.S. carbon emissions. We'll go into greater depth on these practices in a moment, but first let's look at an example of one of these problems out in the world. This is a map of a community in Sampson County, North Carolina. In the top right hand corner, you'll see a Smithfield hog farm, an industrial hog farming operation. The surrounding area has eight households, all, low, all longtime residents, black and mostly low income. Life in this community has been disrupted by the introduction of large scale industrial hog farming. When Smithfield came to Sampson County, they promised clean agricultural practices, respect for the community and good jobs. Instead, the Sampson County farm generated a host of environmental issues, including air and water contamination, increased porcine disease transmission, unpleasant odors, and elevated rates of greenhouse gas emissions. When residents complained of these problems, they were dismissed, which led them to <laughs> excuse me, file suit against Smithfield in 2018. These plaintiffs aren't alone. The problems caused by the Sampson County Farm are common refrains in the communities surrounding large-scale livestock agriculture. And this is just one case study demonstrating the widespread impact of industrial agriculture on our environment and human health. Our bill, the Agricultural Resilience Act, is designed to address these problems and others like it by proposing a series of agricultural reforms and programs designed to encourage sustainable agricultural practices. This graphic demonstrates the relative greenhouse gas emissions associated with different aspects of agriculture. While our bill aims to address each sector, we've limited our analysis today to three significant categories. Animal agriculture and waste, which corresponds to the livestock and fisheries figure on this slide, soil management, which falls under crop production and land use, and food loss and waste, which it's important to note, cuts across each of these categories. We'll start each section with a brief overview of the problem at hand, provide some scientific background, and then move on to our next category. We'll now go into greater depth on a problem you already know a little about from our case study, animal agriculture and waste, which as you can see here, contributes 14% of global emissions from livestock operations. As we know from our discussion of North Carolina's hog farms, livestock agriculture impacts the environment in a lot of different ways. While our bill is primarily focused on reducing greenhouse gas emissions, it also addresses a number of other important environmental problems, all of which are interconnected. Contaminants from waste is the first one we've listed here. Industrial livestock generate a number of contaminants in their waste, including E. coli. Common waste disposal methods, like the anaerobic lagoon, which you can see in the bottom image on this slide, uh, to spread these contaminants while generating large quantities of harmful greenhouse gases. In addition, some livestock emit greenhouse gases simply through digestion, and we'll talk a bit about that process later on. 
In the example we looked at at the beginning of the, this presentation, waste products were spread throughout the community due to the use of waste storage lagoons. Lagoons are effectively huge trenches filled with waste that's exposed to the open air. And you can see one in the middle of this diagram in that brown box. Waste is stored in these trenches where it ferments and is eventually sprayed onto surrounding fields to be used as a fertilizer. Waste products are emitted into the surrounding environment at several points in this process. You can see in the graphic that there is emission to air taking place at several points, including in the center and right hand side of the graphic. You may recall North Carolina residents commented on foul odor and hog fecal matter spreading within their homes. This is likely due to these emissions to air. Contaminants also percolate into soil and water at several points in this process, again in the center and right hand side of the graphic. Lastly, and perhaps most significantly, waste lagoons support bacteria that release carbon dioxide and methane into the atmosphere. We know a little bit about the methane emissions generated by manure storage, but it's worth noting that cattle themselves also contribute to the greenhouse gas emissions directly through a process called enteric fermentation. This graphic walks you through the breakdown of feed in a cow's three stomachs. The short version of this idea is that cattle chew on feed and then begin to break that feed down to access hard to reach nutrients. As food passes through each stomach chamber, it gets more and more reduced, but the digestive processes in the cow's stomachs generate methane, which gets released when they belch. Now that you have an understanding of the byproducts of digestion and waste storage, let's talk a bit about the work that goes into growing the crops that feed these animals as well as humans. We're moving on to soil management. 52% of US land is used for agriculture, and with that come a number of environmental issues. Before we begin, we need to establish a baseline understanding of the importance of our soil as a carbon sink. Carbon in organic matter enters the soil through a few different pathways and can be stored there if the soils are well managed. As you can see in this graphic, plants absorb CO2 during photosynthesis and use its carbon to store energy from the sun in organic compounds. Once they've made these compounds, plants leak carbon storing organic matter into the soil through their roots. This contributes to carbon stocks in the soil itself. You can observe this process in the bottom half of the diagram. The organic carbon released into soil by plants acts as an important structural component of the soil while reducing greenhouse gas concentrations in the atmosphere. The same benefits are incurred when carbon enters the soil through the decomposition of organic matter. However, many common agricultural practices result in the depletion of these carbon stocks, which in turn weakens soil structure and makes it harder to grow crops we need, in addition to reducing important greenhouse gas storage capacity. Practices like tilling and continuous crop growth accelerate the rate of decline in soil carbon. Tilling is a broad term used to describe common land cultivation practices. Unfortunately, these practices can break apart soil structure and thereby expose organic matter to microbes that consume that organic matter. Continuous crop growth is the use of fields without a fallow period or crop alternation. I want to note that a fallow period is effectively just a resting period for the field. These types of agricultural practices lead to the deterioration of soil structure, which in turn leads to a reduction of pore space for water and airflow. These changes to water and airflow can then reduce agricultural capacities and lead to an increase in atmospheric carbon. They are also associated with decreases in soil fertility. So to make up for that loss, farmers need to apply fertilizer to their fields, a process that is often energy intensive. Fertilizer may compensate for the loss of organic matter, but it will also add additional emissions to the agricultural process. If we want to build a more sustainable agricultural system, we also need to look at the consumption of the products we grow and the livestock we raise. 40% of US food is wasted or lost each year. You may notice I've drawn a distinction here between waste and loss. Food loss occurs during production, storage, processing, and distribution. This often happens when farmers grow more than they expect they'll sell or need to sell to account for potential losses caused by weather events or the presence of pests. It can also take place in a factory setting where some processed foods may only use a part of each ingredient to generate the final product. By contrast, food waste occurs during consumption, meaning in our homes and restaurants. This may be due to large portion sizes or our failure to use products before they go bad. 
we wanted to show this graphic to give you a sense of all the different opportunities for energy waste in our food system. At each level of the system, so farming, processing, uh, wholesale retail, some food is discarded and left to decay in a landfill. Additionally, energy inputs are also wasted. Growing food and raising livestock is energy intensive, uses lots of water, and as we've discussed, generates substantial greenhouse gas emissions. Transportation of all these products burns fossil fuels, and if products are wasted or lost and make their way to a landfill, they'll then incur additional fossil fuel losses. Once in a landfill, food will decay anaerobically, which produces methane emissions. Essentially, if we fail to efficiently allocate and use the food we grow and livestock we raise, we are both wasting initial inputs and adding additional greenhouse gas emissions during the decay of those products. All of the problems we've discussed today are interconnected and we cannot adequately address one problem, whether that's carbon loss in our soils or greenhouse gas emissions from livestock, without examining others. Our bill, the Agriculture Resilience Act, takes an interconnected view of the problems that plague the US agricultural system and puts forth bold ideas that will make broad and systemic improvements to the way US agriculture functions. We'll be talking about these solutions later in the semester, but we'd like to preview some of the core elements of the bill. The Agriculture Resilience Act has set a goal of a 50% reduction in greenhouse gas emissions from agriculture by 2030 and net zero emissions by 2040. This is an ambitious goal and we'll talk more about how the bill advances that goal later in the semester. The bill also increases federal investment in public food and agriculture research with a focus on sustainable practices. Lastly, the bill establishes an array of new programs on soil health, farmland preservation, pasture-based livestock, and on-farm renewable energy. I look forward to exploring these and other solutions with you later in the semester. Thank you for your time this morning. I am happy to answer any questions. Thank you very much, Emily. Very nice briefing. Very well done. Stephanie, do we have any questions? We do. Let's see. We have a question from Carson. Um, hi, Emily. Thanks for that presentation. Um, I wanted to ask about the case study that you opened with, the um, 2018 lawsuit against Smithfield. I've heard of some similar um, lawsuits against major agricultural corporations. So I was just wondering um, if that was an effective or impactful lawsuit and if you found these sort of grassroots legal approaches to be effective in general. Yeah, um, I was really hoping someone would ask about the lawsuit because there was lots of detail that we couldn't put into this presentation. Um, so this particular suit did not end well. Um, basically, uh, the plaintiffs received about $100,000 in compensatory uh, fees, it, which is not what they were hoping for. The prior year, there had been four other lawsuits in North Carolina, I think all of which were against Smithfield or Smithfield subsidiaries. Uh, and one of them had a huge payout. It was like a $57 million payout. Um, so they can be successful, but uh, something that confused me as I read up on these was that a lot of these suits are built around um, what, at, at least in my view, is the least empirically provable piece of the problem, which is odor, um, as opposed to water contamination, disease spread, um, and other metrics that are available. So uh, that may account for why some of the suits have been more successful than others. Um, in terms of whether I feel this kind of grassroots activism is effective, I do think it is significant uh, that more and more people, <clears throat> in particular in North Carolina where our case study is centered, are paying attention to these industrial farming operations and thinking critically about the impact these farms have on the community. But at the same time, uh, Smithfield, for example, is closely tied to a lot of local politicians in North Carolina, um, which may account for the lack of movement. So I think it's a mixed bag. All right, we have lots of questions. Um, Nick was asking, can pasture-based farms match the current scale of meat production or does the bill depend on lower demand? Um, that is a good question. And I think we'll be able to provide you with more metrics on that as we talk more about solutions, but the bill does not rely on lower demand. I can't speak to whether pasture-based systems will be able to match the current scale of production with any degree of specificity, but I can uh, consult with my team and get back to you. Great, uh, next we'll have Jessica talk. 
Hi, yes, um, great presentation, Emily, and good morning, everyone, and good evening for some. Um, Emily, you mentioned that organic matter decay was good for soils. Um, if that's the case, why is food loss on farms um, from de natural disasters or pests a problem? Yeah, um, I actually have the same question for our resident soil expert, uh, Abigail. If you have questions, incidentally, about soil management, I would highly encourage you to reach out to her. Um, but I think the way that I think about it is that the inputs that go into producing that crop vastly outweigh any benefits you might have from the crop decay from the crop decaying like um, within the fields. So the emissions generated by producing the crop um, are still being wasted because the gains from the decay just don't outweigh the cost. Okay, uh, I see we have a bunch of questions, but we'll take one more. Uh, so you'll get a fourth question and then we'll, I will end the briefing. Uh, Stephanie, who's the, who can do next, the next yep. one? Yep, Sarah raised her hand first, so we'll let her go. Hi, thank you so much. And Emily, congratulations, what a great presentation. Um, my question relates to a, a fact that you stated in your presentation, which is that 14% of emissions from animal production um, or that there's 14 emissions percent coming from animal production to greenhouse gases. Is that statistic just from the United States or is that a global uh, percentage? Yeah, that is a good question. I believe it is global, but I will have to go back and check my notes. Okay, well, thank you very much, Emily. Wonderful presentation. I'm glad we, we got so much interest from the group um, and uh, We'll, we'll wrap this one up. It's now about 11.04, and uh, we'll hear from our uh, last briefer for, uh, on the emergency preparedness through One Health Act uh, at uh, 11.08. So let's take a break again.
Okay, welcome back, everybody. Uh, now we are ready for the final midterm briefing for the semester. And this is on advancing emergency preparedness uh, through the One Health Act of 2019. Uh, the advisor is Professor Louise Rosen. Uh, and Cecilia, if you are ready, uh, let's begin. Okay, thank you. So hello everyone, my name is Cecilia Magos and I will be presenting on behalf of my team on the bill Advancing Emergency Preparedness Through One Health Act of 2019. Our faculty advisor is Louise Rosen and I just wanna thank my team for all the help in putting this presentation together. So let's get started. Okay. So imagine you are a worker at a concentrated animal feeding operation in North America. And one day you get a shipment of pigs from across the pond and soon they're mixed among the pigs in your facility. Uh, you start to notice that a couple of your pigs start getting sick, so you help isolate them. And then you head home when your shift ends. That same weekend, you hang out with a couple of friends and then one of them lets you know a few days later that they started to feel sick. If this would have been April 2009, there's a very high chance that this would have been a case of H1N1 or swine flu, the latest pandemic until recently. The CDC estimated that this single zoonotic disease outbreak resulted in 60.8 million cases and over 12,000 deaths between April 2009 and April 2010, 12 times greater than the impact due to seasonal influenza from 1976 to 2001. Stenosis are much more common than we may believe, and currently we are unfortunately living through another zoonotic disease outbreak, COVID-19, that's reached a pandemic level that we've never seen before. Uh, and currently the U.S. accounts for 25% of the global death rate. And given the recent spike in positive cases in the southern states, we expect that this number will rise. So this pandemic, if anything, has illustrated the need for a collaborative government response based on the One Health framework, which leads us to the bill that we will be discussing today. So on the agenda, I will be introducing our bill, give a brief overview of the One Health framework the bill will expand on, define synodic infections, identify some of the pathways for synodic spillover, highlight the impact of our proposed legislation, identify some of the key stakeholders, and then our next steps moving forward. So the Advancing Emergency Preparedness Through One Health Act of 2019 is a multi-sectoral response to public health threats that can cause major economic impact and identify potential bioterrorism. The bill was introduced to the House on July 2019 by Representative Kurt Schrader, um, and its goal is to advance federal efforts to prevent prepare and respond to zoonotic disease outbreaks using a collaborative One Health framework. It currently has 14 co-sponsors and bipartisan support as well. So the One Health framework is cited as an integrative initiative that recognizes human, animal, and environmental health as interconnected and promotes collaboration across all sectors and discipline to help solve global health problems. And this bill specifically aims to target those caused by stenosis. I've been mentioning stenosis and zoonotic infections, but what are they really? Um, stenosis are, stenotic infections, sorry, are caused by pathogens transmitted from a host animal to humans through direct or indirect contact. And they account for 75% of newly emerging infectious diseases uh, from 1940 to 2004. So many of these pathogens already exist in our natural environment. However, there are several factors that are increasing our exposure and susceptibility to these infections. In order for these pathogens to infect human and the human population, they need to cross three biological barriers. First is the interspecies, which is the initial exposure between an infected animal and a human. Then we have the intrahuman, which is when the pathogen is able to multiply and reproduce in the individual. And finally, the interhuman, which means the pathogen can now be transmitted among the population. The pathways to zoonotic spillover have increased due to human disruptions to the natural environment. Changes in climatic conditions have altered the geographic range and density of several host animals. 
For example, mosquitoes are very sensitive to changes in temperature and are known to be vector for several different zoonoses like malaria. Our warming temperatures are making mosquitoes that carry malaria able to survive and reproduce in places that were previously too cold, like in the southern states here in the US. This has caused the number of cases in the US to steadily increase since the mid 1970s. Also, our modern land use practices have severely diminished the natural barrier between humans and animals, increasing our exposure, infection, and transmissibility of stenosis that otherwise would have been very unlikely. An example of this is very evident in Lyme disease, where urban development has altered the predator-prey dynamics between animals, resulting in an increase in likelihood of the ticks to jump to human populations due to our closer proximity to them. And our final point, uh, the way that we interact with animals via the CAFOs that I mentioned previously or illegal trade and our dependence on these animals to help sustain our way of life augments our risk for future pandemics. The SARS outbreak, for example, originated from a wet market from a province in China where wild animals come into contact that otherwise wouldn't in the natural world. Again, stenosis are not new, but our increase in global trade, travel, and transportation are increasing our exposure. The CDC estimates that there are over 2.5 billion annual cases of zoonotic infections, resulting in 2.7 million annual global deaths. And the global cost from six zoonotic outbreaks between 1997 and 2009 was over $80 billion. In the US, avian influenza has led to losses of $3.3 billion in related industries and led to the call of nearly 50 million birds, which affects our vaccine development. And it is also estimated that 80% of known poten potential pathogens likely to be used in bioterrorism are of zoonotic origin. So we definitely expect these numbers to rise without any proper intervention. This is why the Advancing Emergency Preparedness Through One Health Act will work to establish 10-year federal goals and priorities to promote interagency coordination and expand our partnerships to foster scientific understanding of the interconnectedness between human, animal, and environmental health, uh, identify, study, and surveil priority zoonotic diseases and their transmission pathways, and finally, to advance protocols and workforce development to improve our prevention, response, and recovery. This framework is already used in other countries across the world. For example, in the UK, One Health is used to monitor antibiotic resistance in their livestock to reduce the risk of an outbreak among their civilian population. So this is something that can be adopted to our government as well. I do want to acknowledge that One Health is not completely new to us. Our current framework does include a couple of agencies such as the CDC and the Department of Agriculture. However, this bill hopes to expand and invite additional stakeholders from relevant agencies. And the collaborating parties will be monitored by the Secretary of Health and Human Services, Alex Azar, and the Secretary of Agriculture, Sonny Perdue. The new collaborative effort will include the US Agency for International Development that can provide training and support to the next generation workforce, the Environmental Protection Agency to help develop environmentally sustainable responses and strategies, the Homeland, Department of Homeland Security and the Department of Defense, sorry, to work against potential bioterrorism threats and the Department of the Interior and the Department of Commerce to help understand linkages between environmental conditions and health outcomes. So together they will all align their efforts with the CDC, the Food and Drug Administration, the Office of the Assistant Secretary for Preparedness and Response, and other departments and agencies and partners as appropriate, including states, Indian tribes, academic institutions, non-governmental organization, and other private entities. So this is a very comprehensive bill. So in our next steps, we will be including an analysis of the proposed collaborative plan, as well as identifying some of the challenges and other potential impacts of the legislation. To conclude, 
We know that zoonotic infections have been increasing throughout the years and consequently government intervention, such as the proposed advancing emergency preparedness to one health is necessary for clear guidance, not only to respond to these outbreaks, but to have proper preparation and prevention plans on a collaborative one health approach. And just one final note, the current pandemic has only emphasized the need for a prepared response. As of last night, the number of deaths in the U.S. have increased to 121,176, and that's over 3,000 more from the number that is on this slide, which was taken just shy of a week ago. So there's a dire need for a plan of action like emergency preparedness through One Health with a clear focus and leadership, not only to protect our economy and the capacity of our infrastructure, but also most Importantly, the lives of the people this government is also supposed to serve. Thank you, and I will now take any questions. Okay, very nice job. Um, thank you, Cecilia. Stephanie, do we have some questions? See, not yet. Oh, all right, Charlie has a question. Hi, Cecilia. I was just wondering if you knew about the um, U.S. Agency for Inter International Developments program called PREDICT that was taking place under the Bush and Obama administrations and was discontinued under the Trump administration that was responsible for tracking zoonotic diseases. How does this uh, proposed bill sort of build off of the work that that program had been doing or perhaps differ? Um, that's a great question. Our current research, we haven't really found or really dived into that program, but um, the proposed plan hopes to, we're not trying to reinvent the wheel. One Health is already being implemented uh, in the US, just not as with such an expansive network. And it's also being implemented across different countries around the world. So what this bill just kind of aims to do is to just help us better prepare and respond to these outbreaks. Um, and with that, with the program that you mentioned, um, we haven't really dived into that, but I think that is something that we will be looking into as we dissect a little bit more of the proposed legislation. Great. We have a question from Rachel. Hi, Cecilia. Uh, my question is about the prevalence and severity of zoonotic diseases. I think you mentioned something like 2 billion infections per year, which is like orders of magnitude larger than even the confirmed pandemic cases. So are a lot of these infections like minor? That is why we're not hearing about them. Or could you explain a little more about how, why, how there are so many? Right, so a lot of the outbreaks that we um, identify, 75% of them are of zoonotic origin. So they're very, very common. And the number may seem very big because it can be something like salmonella, it could be like malaria, it could be Ebola. So they're a very, very large number. But again, we do expect this number to keep increasing because our human disruptions to the natural environment has left us more exposed to these zoonotic uh, infections. So that's why we need a proposed, a prepared response to them. Thanks. We have a final question. Last call for questions. All right, I think that's it. Okay, well, thank you again. Uh, thank you, everybody. Uh, <clears throat> let me just mention um, what we've just accomplished. Uh, first, in uh, about an hour and 20 minutes, uh, we have gone through five major pieces of environmental legislation. Uh, we've summarized uh, these pieces of legislation and the nature of the problem they're addressing uh, succinctly uh, and with, uh, with uh, really great communication, great graphics, carefully thought through. Everybody's worked very hard to hone these messages. And the reason why this is such a valuable exercise, frankly, is this is what you're going to be doing uh, for your entire career. And I want you to think about how much you knew about these problems in these programs the day after Memorial Day or two days after Memorial Day when you arrived in the workshop and how much more you know now. 
And what this really demonstrates is the educational impact of learning by doing. When you're actually engaged in trying to really figure out what does this bill say? What's the nature of this problem? You really learn a lot more than just by sitting around and you know, just doing a normal assignment. Uh, and you know a lot about these. When by the, by the end of next semester, you're, th these groups will know more about these legislation, this legislation and the problems than pretty much anybody else in the country, if not the world. And so I want you to think about how the learning process takes place and also how we've shared with each other uh, our knowledge of these bills. Those of us who are not uh, in immersed in the bill, you know, from other groups, we sit and we get a 10 minute briefing, which really does get us uh, up to speed in a really amazing way on what we've learned so far. So what's gonna happen next is we're gonna focus, you know, we've now focused on the problem and, and the way the bill's structured. Now we're gonna get into the solution. How do we solve this problem? And what's the science behind the solution? Uh, and we'll also talk about other things like performance metrics. So uh, in celebration of uh, July 4th, we're going to be taking next week off uh, from workshop. I understand you have some other work you need to be doing in some of these science courses and so on. Uh, but we're going to take the week off from workshop and then we'll return the following week. Uh, Professor Apps and I will talk a little bit about performance measurement and we'll start getting into the science uh, of the solution, the solution itself. So again, a wonderful job, everybody. 